Grace and peace. Welcome to another edition of Mackin' with Christ. I'm your host, Thais Sherell. And we have been bringing to you a series of stories of people who've been through many obstacles in their lives and still found the strength to overcome. And today we're bringing to you another phenomenal story in the person of Janet McDonald. And Janet is the author of the book, which you may or may not have read, but it's an awesome story of her life and a testimony of where she's been, and she's here to tell you where she's at now. Welcome, Janet McDonald. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Janet, um, you've been the author of the book, Project Girl. Yes. Tell me about what made you decide to write the book, Project Girl. Well, I was working in Paris as a lawyer, and I met a friend of mine from college, and we were talking about our lives, and when I told her my life story, she said, you need to write a book. And I laughed and thought, well, who would be interested in my story? I'm no celebrity, no one famous. And then she said, I work in Hollywood. You need to write a book about your life. And that's how I first started thinking about maybe doing a memoir. And then I, from there, I got the names of some agents and sent a proposal out. And Project Girl was born. Now, up until that point, you have, uh you said something about your life, you know, celebrity, but I mean, your life was amazing. You didn't think that there was something uh, that was happening in your life that didn't happen to the ordinary people that needed to be told. I have to say that at that time, I really had never thought about myself as being extraordinary or having a story that was so out of the ordinary that it would be something that could go into a book or form a book. Since then, since I wrote Project Girl and I've gotten so much feedback from people by email and mail and people I meet even in the subway, I realize that the book actually did touch a chord because a lot of people have had not exactly the same ups and downs I've had in life, but they definitely have had ups and downs. And so they could identify just from the fact that I struggled to overcome what I had to overcome and was able to do that. Now, Janet, you were born and raised in Farragut Housing in Brooklyn, is yes, that correct? Yes, yes. Now, tell me about uh, your family environment growing up in Brooklyn. You have your mom and dad, and, and of course, we're all familiar with uh, Janet's sister, Joyce McDonald, who's, who shares with us many times. And was there a spiritual kind of foundation that was laid while you were younger? Well, I grew up with my um, six brothers and sisters, a two-parent home, which can sometimes be rare in the project, so that, that was a blessing. And my father and mother really encouraged all of us to go to school and do studies and try to achieve what they felt maybe that they had not been able to achieve when they were growing up in the South. And um, so we would go to church to the open door, in fact, down the block growing up, and I would say that with the support of the parents and a positive environment, that's what enabled me to achieve what I have. Okay, well, why don't you tell me, tell me about the experience of the open door. What did you feel going to church? I mean, did you feel any connection at that time? I know you were going through from reading uh, Janet's book, and if you haven't read it, we'll try to talk a little bit about the book so that you can understand a little bit about Janet's life and what she's had to overcome. While you were going there to church at the open door, what was your connection uh, to the church or to God or spirituality? What were you feeling at that time, if anything? Well, truthfully. <laughs> truthfully? <laughs> truthfully, I was a kid, and so I was going with my, my brothers and sister, and we were just going because our mother said, go to church on Sunday. And so we would go into the, where the sermon was being given and just sort of sit there. I would actually look out the window and daydream. But it was nice. It was a nice feeling. I can't say that I was religious at that time, but it was still a nice energy that was in the church of people who were praying and singing. And so it felt good to be there, even though at that time I didn't really define it as a religious experience. Would you say, uh, did they have anything that was uh, directed towards children? Because I know 
you know, I've, I've had my daughters in a couple of churches and I've noticed that in certain churches, they would just kind of zone out and, you know, mm -hmm. mommy, I want to bring the books. I don't want to read it. So for me, it was important to find a church that had a good children's ministry. And I noticed that when I changed them to a place that had something that uh, would tap into uh, their lives at that moment, you know, that can address things on their level that they took an interest. So would you say that was, you know, that kind of wasn't there when you were going up? Well, it was there a little bit because there were activities for children. There, there was interest in children and getting us to be more interested in, in what was going on. I can't say that I recall there being an active children's ministry. Okay. So, you know, Janet's going to church and she's daydreaming, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're thinking about all this stuff and you're, you're going through life. Okay, you know, in the book I, I noticed that in school you were the brilliant one. You were... She was kind of like the Einstein. <laughs> she was the Einstein of the neighborhood. You see that guy right. smiling. In You're the dreams. Einstein of the neighborhood, but you were also quiet. You were quiet. Why don't you tell me about going through school? I wasn't the Einstein because actually when I, I skipped from the fourth grade to the sixth grade in elementary school, PS 27, but there were five of us who skipped at the same time. So there were five Einsteins, basically. I just took to school. I liked school. I liked reading. I liked that when I did well in school, it made the teachers seem to really like me and it made my parents proud. So I was sort of a, a school type. I was a bookworm type of a person. But I, I enjoyed it. You enjoyed it? Yeah. That is awesome. So you're in school and, you know, what were some of your aspirations? I mean, you were growing up in the projects at the time and, I mean, did you see yourself then? that you were going to go off to become this uh, a lawyer and, and an author. What did you perceive of yourself at that time? I didn't have any aspirations, actually, because I was a kid, so I had very short-term aspirations like pass a test, get promoted, look forward to summer. I never really knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, and when teachers would ask us, I would just say what I thought was the standard appropriate response. So I might say, I want to be a teacher, I want to be a scientist. But I didn't really have any clear-cut aspirations. I knew that I liked to write, and so that was something I did even as a girl. I would write little stories or just write little lists of things. But mostly, I was just in school. School was my aspiration, actually, just to be in school and do well. And I just kept doing that same thing over and over for many years <laughs> until I had to stop going to school because I had three higher degrees <laughs> and it was time to go to work. Can you imagine that? You just want to keep going to school. I know you want to tap into that place in her brain <laughs> for your children, for yourself, where you just want to keep going and keep striving. Mm -hmm. that I is liked <laughs> learning. I liked discovering things and I really wasn't that eager to go into the work world. So I just thought, I'll stay in school. When I was, in fact, I would come home from college in the summers and people would call me a professional student <laughs> because they're like, are you still in school? I thought you, gr you graduated from college. Then I would, you know, I got a master's in journalism, then I got a law degree. I liked it. Okay, so we see, Janet, that you were grown up in the period where the drugs were just being introduced on the scene. And of course, back in the days, as you've seen, I know growing up with the children, people wanted to try different things and, and no one really understood the effect that drugs would have on so many people. Tell me your recollection of what was going on and, and why do you think people chose to, to try it? Was there something lacking? I think that, um, well, my recollection is that I think towards the 70s, people started, like peers and friends in the neighborhood just started to seem to get on drugs. And um, why? I think the, I think for a lot of reasons, there, there wasn't the support, I think the societal support for school programs the way there had been when I was in elementary, junior high, and high school. The economy was suffering in New York in the 70s. New York even went bankrupt at one point. And so jobs were vanishing from the neighborhood. And so people weren't getting jobs and they wanted money and they were just kind of bored and hanging out and kind of fell into it, I think. Mm. And it, it, it was definitely a devastating um, phenomenon that was going on there. 
And, you know, one of the things that I tend to think is that what causes people to, to grasp onto drugs is that there's a lack in their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, I'm sure many of you, I know in my family, we've had people that have gotten caught on so many different things. And, and what I found in, in looking at the situations, that there was a hunger. People are always looking for something else. Yeah. And, that's, and that's why when I started the interview, I talked about what was the, the background in the home? What was going on in, in the home as far as, you know, a, a sense of, of Christ, you know, a, set, a sense of spirituality, that connection, because I find many times that when that's not there, and sometimes when it's there, but if, if the young person or if the person is not connecting, you know, then all of a sudden there's a void in their lives. Mm -hmm. And many times people go throughout lives and they're trying different things, they're trying drugs, they're trying different relationships, everything that you can name of, they're trying to kind of pacify something that's lacking within Yes. You know, and, and, it, and it doesn't stop. You know, even today, I would, I would say in society, there's a lot of people who are still, they want to try this and they want to try that. But that's because there's something missing in mm -hmm. their lives, you know. And, and that's, you know, one of the things that we share a lot with our audience, that there's, it doesn't matter how much money you have. You can have billions of dollars, but there's always going to be a void in your life. And I believe that the void is, is Christ that's in people's lives. Now, I feel that, you know, what's happening today, many people are afraid to uh, tap into God or tap into the church because of d the way that uh, certain uh, churches are set up, the structures. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say about that? Well, I would say that... Um a lot of young people probably feel that church isn't for me because it's for old people and that, you know, church isn't where it's happening. But I think that what you're saying is true. I think people have a sense of emptiness without even really, without really feeling or realizing that that's what it is. And like I was watching this um, gospel awards show, mm -hmm. music awards show on TV last week, and it was amazing because the energy like in that room and, you know, it was just an award show when they were giving out little trophies, but it was so different from watching the Grammys and other, and I watch a lot of music awards or MTV, because you could feel like there was just this powerful energy. It really struck me. And um, I remember saying to the people that, who were watching it with me, like, I wish I could just feel what they're feeling because it was intense. And they all, anytime they got an award, they were thanking God and like, crying and like just there was a, a depth of feeling that you don't see on other awards show and of course the music was great and also there was a lack of that sort of egomaniacal attitude that a lot of people have when they get an award and like they were strutting around like it's all about me on this show so many people said you know it is not this is not about me this is about God this is about Jesus who gave me the gift so it really, it really struck me, and I wrote down the name of the CD because I want to get it with all the gospel music. Oh, awesome, awesome. I wonder if I have it. What, okay, so you said, you know, people look at that and they say, you know, what is that? They realize that there's something greater going on and there's something that's filling the void. What stops people from going after that? What stops, what do you think stops people from going after Christ? Well, I think that people think it's not cool, for one thing, and, and they don't realize that it can be just a personal experience that you feel inside. It doesn't mean that you have to you know, change your way of being if it's like not a destructive way of being. I think people just don't realize the, the strength of it, especially like I've seen how it's transformed my sister's life, my sister Joyce, and just really made her into this totally different, positive, powerful person. Also my brother Kevin, who they're both saved. I'm not, <laughs> but I see it's sort of like I'm bearing witness to this phenomenon that, you know, I'm still contemplating. But I see the effects of it and it makes me think there is something going on. They have something that they didn't have before. That's right, and and that's one of the things. That's the uh, one of the things I want to talk about. You've seen your sister Joyce. I mean, Joyce, and and we've you've heard her story. You you've seen her website. I mean, Joyce went from you know a heavy uh, drug addict, you know, prostitution, 
And now Joyce is this phenomenal woman of God. I mean, and when she speaks, your, your spirit just bears witness. You've seen Joyce then and you've seen Joyce now. And, and so looking at her, there's something that's going on in her life, you would say, that makes you want to say, you know what, I, I, wanna, I wonder what that's all about. Oh, definitely, especially when um, her daughter, Makiba, told me the story about how she was in the hospital having surgery and they had to do something really quickly and didn't have time to give her an anesthetic. And that she was like, she was just singing a gospel and she didn't feel any pain. Yes. It was like she had transcended her body. Not just that, but that's like the most dramatic example. But basically just seeing how she became a different person, a positive person, a healthy person. And it was kind of miraculous to see someone be so transformed over the course of a few years because most people pretty much go through life and you know you see them 10, 20 years later and they're kind of the same person and doing basically the same things. And then other people just go through some kind of amazing transformation. Well, I tell you out there in TV land, you made me watch and Janet McDonald Project Girl now, but I'm telling you, you watch her within the next several years and you're also <laughs> going to see an amazing transformation and you know why I know that I have this is the first time that I have ever met Janet but uh, I would say about a year ago and I emailed her she was placed on my spirit yes Joyce you know mentioned her and how much he loves her sister and Janet this but you know and I said okay Joyce and she gave me your book and I mm -hmm. said okay and it sat on my shelf for like a couple of years and then something in my spirit just you know, Joyce mentioned your, your name once, and then something just began to stir in my spirit. And I says, okay. So I went and I picked up the book, and I, and I read the first, you know, several pages, and I says, God, there's something that you're going to do in Janet's life. Mm. And I began to read the book, and I began to cry. And I wasn't crying for me. I was crying for a lot of things that was going on in your life back then. Mm -hmm. My spirit began to connect and I identify with a lot of things that was going on and I says, God, he began to show me things that were not even in the pages. And I began to pray for you. And I'm sure your sister, that's why people, there's people out there. And let me tell you something, God is going to change things in your lives. And for those of you who are praying for other people, don't stop praying, you know, because you know, sometimes things go on in families where, or in friendships where you feel that you can't relate to people or, or something happens and they don't want to hear anything that you have to say. But don't stop praying because God is always setting up connections and he's going to minister. Trust me, God says that if you pray, the prayers of the righteous avail of much. And if you continue to pray, God is going to begin to work on your behalf because God already knows whose name is in the Lamb's book of life. And let me tell you, if God has your name or your son's name or your daughter's name or your sister's name in the Lamb's books of life, you can believe that when God comes back, that person is going to be ready to be caught up to meet God when he comes. And, and Janet, I, I found myself sitting there, a person that I've never known, and I began to cry out in the spirit. And I says, God, I felt like I had this burden. I says, God, I've, I've got to meet this woman. I'm carrying this burden and I don't know who she is. You know, I'm feeling this. And he just had me praying for you and praying for you. And I just felt the, such a love of the Lord and a connection. I says, man, she doesn't even know I exist. But yet God had placed that burden on you. And, and I know that that's a result of prayer from your sister, prayer your mother and it was going out. And it's amazing how God can just take a situation and Little do you know that God is, is doing something in your life, Janet. He's about to do something so miraculous in your life that, I mean, what you, what you see in the life of your sister, Joyce McDonald, is nothing compared to what God's going to do for you. Hey, I'm ready. Whoa! <laughs> I want it, whatever Ooh! it is. <laughs> you hear that, God? She is ready. Because Go, Janet. <laughs> <It's your birthday. laughs> yes, Janet. He he's definitely gonna he's gonna do something. Yes. There's a there's something in you in the in, in your life. And 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 I hear you refer to yourself as just oh I'm just ordinary. People go through this. No. We go through things so that other people can live. And I'm, and I'm sure your book, you know, Project Girl, has really helped a lot of people, a lot of doors open mm -hmm. for people to say, you know what, I've been through this, she made it, I can make it. But that's just, that's just uh, 
the, the mixing and the cake. It's not even the cake and it's not the ices. Because when God does the total change in your life, when people begin to read up the books that you, that you wrote in the past are nothing uh, to the books that you're going to write in the, in, in, the, in the future. And when people begin to lift and open up the pages of your book, their lives are going to be transformed. You're going to see people who, who were in mental institution losing their minds, and, 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 and they're going to just pick up your book, and, and they're going to come right back to, to normalcy. God is going to do things, these things in your life. You didn't go through that stuff, and you didn't go through. In the book, Janet talks about going, being raped on campus, you know, how, how you know, the struggles of, of, of fitting in, so many different things, and just trying a little bit, uh, trying a little bit of this, you know, you went out looking for, you know, spirituality, trying to find some connection. And God didn't allow you to find it then because he needed you to go through all of those pieces of the, of the puzzle. You had to go through this. I mean, Janet went off to Paris and left us and everything else, but it's okay because God is going to take all of those pieces to the puzzle and then he's going to rebuild you. And when I say that Janet McDonald is going to be a powerhouse and you watch out, I mean, you guys know we had Natina Reed who was in the, in the group Black. And I, I remember the first interview that I had with Natina out in um, Georgia. And, and we talked and I talked about what she was doing. And then I began to share with my, my testimony. And, and I said, you know, you think you're ever going to do, you know, gospel music? And she's like, oh, no, I'm not thinking of it. But let me tell you, Natina, a year later, this mm -hmm. woman is a firehouse. She left the group, as you know. She's a preacher. She goes around preaching. She was just here preaching in Brooklyn. I mean, and the anointing on her life. I mean, God has blessed her where she can lay hands on people and people are healed. And, and that's the kind of things that God is going to do and even greater for you. The more things that we go through, the greater the elevation that God is, is going to take us through. So Janet, I, I want to know, are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. She is ready. <laughs> well, let me tell you out there, you guys just keep Janet in your prayer because I'm telling you, she is, she is going to be a powerhouse. And, and you guys are going to be calling her, say, we got to come and get her to pray for us, come and get her to a church. And you're going to remember that you saw the start right here, <laughs> right here. But Janet, before we, we're going to, we're going to pray with you and, and we're just going to ask God that, that God will just continue to mold you in the path that he's going to take you in because he's about to do a serious breakthrough in your life. And it's no coincidence that you said, okay, Thais, after me sending all these emails, finally answer my, my emails. I was starting to get a complex. No, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was your time to, to respond to me when you did, because God is about to do a move in your life. But before we get onto that, I just want to, I just want to talk to you about what's going on in your life now. What kind of projects are you working on now? Well, I just, um, I have a book out, a new book out called Brotherhood, which is there. Should I pick it up? Sure. <laughs> this is my book, Brotherhood, and it's, I've actually become an author of, of young adult novels, so I write books for teenagers, and it's about a boy growing up in Harlem who goes to a private school and has to juggle the two different worlds, a little bit like what I did. And I also was involved as an editor in the book that my brother, Kevin, wrote called Project Boy, and it's the story of his life and his experiences. So I have a, and I, there are other books I want to write too. Interesting that what you just said, because today I was watching the news or a, a talk show and they, there was a woman being interviewed and she was a writer. So of course I was curious. And they said that she was a writer of Christian literature. Yes. And like the number one selling, of course I didn't even know there was such a thing. So I'm just kind of listening and listening to her and listening to the audience. And it was, it just seems like kind of coincidental that that happened, that you're here, that I'm supposed to be in Paris right now. I changed my date of departure three times. Wow. <laughs> so I would have been gone. So I don't know how it all fits together. I'm sure you do, but <laughs> that's what's going on with me now. Well, let me tell you, that's not all that's going to be going on with you. Like I said, you are going to do some writing and God is going to do some healing in your life. And, uh, you know, if you have a chance, pick up the book Project Girl and visit her website, which is uh, www.projectgirl.com, and, 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 and see what's going on with Janet. And I'm telling you, see her now, but you're going to see her later. I mean, this powerful woman of God. And even now, I call you powerful woman of God because that's what God calls you, and that's the place that he's calling you to. And um, 
before we go, we're going to uh, we're going to bring you some other clips. But before we uh, move on, we're just going to take time to just even pray with with Janet right here, my sister. Father God, I thank you right now for my sister Janet. God, I praise you, God, for the things that you have done in her life, God. Oh, God, I even praise you for the trials and the circumstance that she had to go through. For we know, God, that she didn't just go through these things, God, without you, but that you were there with her all the time, God. All those times, God, when she was in her room curled up in a ball, God, thinking that, God, there's got to be more than this, God. You are setting her up for greatness right now. Even now, I destroy every foul spirit that tried to linger around her, every suicidal spirit that would just hover around her, every self-esteem spirit that would just try to hold her back and let her think that she was less than great, less than the great woman of God that you have called her to be. Even now, even now I lay an ax to every generational spirit, every foul spirit that would try to speak to her mind. Even now, I lay an ax to it right now in the name of Jesus. I even speak that out of her belly will come livers, waters of living water. Even now, God, I thank you right now for doing it, God. Oh, God, every hurt and every pain, God. I command it to loose her right now in the name of Jesus Christ, God. Oh, God, I thank you for just giving her a spirit of peace, God. God, I thank you right now. I want you to know the people out there that are praying for your family members, don't stop praying because God is bringing them in. Time is short. God is soon to come and God is ready to crack the sky. I don't care what it looks like in the family. I don't care what it looks like in the world. I don't care what you're going through. God is, he is bringing restoration to the hearts. He's bringing restoration to the home and he's bringing restoration to your mind. I'm saying right now that God is going to do some changes in your life and I want you to just Hold on tight. Don't let go because God has heard your prayers. You've been watching another episode of Mackin' with Christ. And I want you to remember Janet here. Keep her in your prayers and watch her because she is soaring and God is about to do great things in her life. May God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. You've been watching another edition of Mackin' with Christ.